Gentry. The catch, Scarlet Queen. Philip Carney, master. Position, four degrees, five minutes north. 126 degrees, 45 minutes east. Wind brisk, sky fair. Remarks, departed island of Karakalong on schedule after being boarded by armed pirates. Reason for trouble, King Ascot and the maid in waiting. Toward noon, during the best the tropics has to offer in fresh, sun-drenched mornings, that we raised the peaked outline of Karakalong to our starboard and stood in toward Bio Bay. The ripples danced and glimmered in the light. And in two more hours of the spanking breeze, we picked up the creamy surf roaring in over the coral that fenced the bay. My chief mate Gallagher went forward with the heaving lead as I pointed the bow toward the swirling passage through the reef. His soundings came rolling back. Four fathoms of depth. We closed on the opening. Water left. Four. But shallowing to less as the swell beneath us humped and got ready to break. Five the feet. Three. Three and a half fathoms. The roar of water crashing on coral filled our ears. And the sharp teeth of coral filled our minds. Five. The heaving rollers from across the Celebes Sea built and broke on our port and starboard. We felt the current grab, reacted with the wheel. The coral teeth slid by on either side. Red, red, and no bottom. More than 17 fathoms of crystal quiet water beneath us. And I took time to look up from my work. The island in front of us was like a backdrop for a technicolor version of the more idyllic scenes in Mutiny on the Bounty. A mountain slope down which flowed a glacier of multicolored foliage. Palms, tree ferns, cassiorinas, all of it laced and interlaced by rattan and flowering vines. It ended at a sugar-white beach, washed by blue-green water. And as we watched, the final touch entered the picture. Not one, but two, blonde and brunette, dressed in flower-patterned cloth, walked out onto the sand and waved as we worked into anchorage. And so Mutual continues The Voyage of the Scarlet Queen, written by Gil Dowd and Bob Tallman, and starring Elliot Lewis. The Scarlet Queen, proudest ship to plow the seas, bound for uncharted adventure. Every week a complete entry in the log, and every week a league further in the strange voyage of the Scarlet Queen. Five minutes after our hook was secured at the bottom, Gallagher and I were stepping from our dinghy to meet the welcoming committee. The lighter one was short and bursting with herself, the darker, tall and well-contained. She sounded like tea time in Barclay Square. Hello there. Good to have you drop in well, on thanks. us. thanks. We didn't expect to find you here. The charts call the island undeveloped and populated by a somewhat shy group of natives. And so it remains, except for our plantation. Uh-huh. I'm Mrs. Briley, and this is Mrs. Ascot. Well, Phil Carney, how do you do? How do you do? Now, this is Mr. Gallagher, my uh, chief officer. I didn't know you. It's quite a surprise. How do you do, Mr. Gallagher? And now, I do hope that both of you will join us at the cottage. I dare say our husbands are even more anxious to meet you than Jane and I were. Here's the path over here. They stepped out in front of Red and me and led us up the path through a riot of vegetation, primitive, almost stifling with flower scents, bright with colors. Noisy with shrill land birds. Off to the right, we could see straight rows of young and neatly cultivated palm trees. To our front, the rise of the mountain loomed abruptly. And from a point 30 or 40 feet up, a small stream flashed from the mass of growth, curved into space, and fell, hissing and bubbling into a deep, wide pool. Next to this pool was the bungalow, shaded and cooled by ocean breeze. 
The husbands were introduced to us on the veranda. Briarly, well-built, graying slightly. I bid you a hearty welcome, gentlemen. Oh, thanks, Mr. Briarly. Yeah, thanks a lot. Ascot was younger, slim, and fair. Have you had a long voyage, Captain? Oh, not this particular leg, no. We're just up from Halmahera. Oh, a beastly island. Well, short trip or no, you'll enjoy stretching your legs on Caracalong. Uh, Doris, would you mind showing Captain Carney about a bit? Of course not, my dear. And Mr. Gallagher will go with Jane when you've returned the captain to us. Very well. Strangers are rare to us, Captain. I hope you'll understand. Shall we go? She led me through the park-like groves, the clearings where they dried their copra, the warehouses stacked with it. She showed me piles of oyster shell, half dozen more examples of good commercial products they'd collected from the island. Then we stopped on a high point overlooking the Scarlet Queen, resting in the blue-green bay below. Now... Do you blame us for being proud of our island? No, I think you've done a great job, Mrs. Briley. Oh, we've been very fortunate. It's Dutch territory, you know. But my husband's associates formed the Celebes Development Company, and we came here at the close of the war. You certainly seem to have everything. Yes, everything but the worry and turmoil of competitive life. And judging from what news we last heard and the condition of the world, I feel quite fortunate to be separated from it. It's in quite a state, isn't it, Captain? Well, it's not as trouble-free as your island. There was talk even in Macassar of a battle over short or long hemlines. <laughs> hemlines, really? Wouldn't you trade this for that kind of nonsense? No, I wouldn't, Mrs. Briley. I'm afraid I like competition and the rest of it. Tell me, don't you ever get lonesome? Lonely, you mean? Why should I? Fine husband, good company, and the time to enjoy both. Why should any of us want more than we have? <laughs> By the time three days had passed, Red and I were almost ready to agree with her. Our sailing orders were to wait in the bay until one of Kang's luggers arrived. This kind of relaxation was made to order for us after the last few weeks of short trips and troubled ports. We soaked up sunshine and rest. And every night when we returned to the Queen, we agreed that the Briarleys and the Ascots were the most gracious hosts we'd met since Singapore. We called it paradise at least once a day. I was a little disappointed when the first thin wrapping fell off. I was alone in my cabin when Mr. Kingsley Ascot paid me a visit. He browsed through some English-language newspapers and suddenly came to the point. Connie, I hope you won't think me blunt. Your arrival here was the most unfortunate thing that could have happened. I think you're being plenty blunt, King. What are you driving at? You and your ship are the first link we've had with the outside world for over ten months. How long are you going to stay? I don't know. But we can stay aboard ship from now on if that'll help. If we didn't push ourselves into your company, you know. Oh, no, no, no. It isn't that. Where are you going from here? I don't know. Why? Connie, would, would it be possible to arrange passage to some port, any port with regular steamer connections? What? You've been as proud of your paradise as the rest, King. What goes? I'm sorry. Look, I'm sailing under charter orders and I can't take any passengers. Well, I had to ask you. It's not a chance. Not even a slim one, King. I'm sorry. I see. Carney. Carney, be sure that you don't by word or look indicate to Jane or the Briarleys uh, that I've talked to you this way. Your promise, Carney? Yeah, sure, King. I like you all too well to mess things up. I just hope you can settle down again. Huh. Yes, I suppose I can. I've been settled for a good many months. Well, thanks anyway, Carney. I'll meet you in the morning. Thought we might uh, fish a bit from the reef at ebb tide. Sounds great. I'll be in early. Ascot didn't mention his visit all the next day. Once again, the island was an unmarred paradise. But that night brought another evasive visitor to my cabin on the Scarlet Queen. The next one to browse through the newspapers and then look up suddenly was Edward Briarley. Why, right, Joe Carney, I'm so glad you dropped in on us. It's really been a lark having you. But I say, I, I believe in being outspoken. Has Ascot approached you regarding passage from here? Well, it would have been a waste of time if he had, Briarley. I can't take any passengers. Oh, I'm afraid that's a pity. Oh, don't misunderstand me. Ascot's a splendid chap, bright, alert, smashing company. But this type of life is hard on some. I've been about on this estate and that, FMS, North Borneo and the like, and I know the signs. 
Poor Ascot's at the end of his tether. He needs a change. And I had hoped that you might supply him with the transportation. Yeah, well, it's out of the question, Briley. I can't take it. Oh, pity. Stubborn devil, holding it in the way he is. But, Connie, I must be sure of one thing. Hmm? Say nothing to anyone about my visit. Job, if he knew I was aware of his state, his model would shatter. And that the rest soon would do likewise. Do you agree to silence? Yeah, sure, Brown. I won't say a word to anybody. Splendid. Uh, come in for an early swim in the morning, Connie. We'll, we'll have breakfast and make a day of it. I saw him to his canoe, went back to my cabin. But less than 15 minutes had passed before another visitor climbed the ladder over the side and joined me. Captain Connie, I hope you won't think it entirely unforgivable. My being here, I mean. Not at all, Mrs. Briley. Yes, sir. Thank you. I, I'm so distressed. My husband was here. What did he want, Captain? Why, nothing. Did he want you to leave? He didn't say so. Well, I couldn't bear it if you did. Please, Captain, don't leave without me. I'll die if you do. What are you handing me, Mrs. Briley? I'm begging you. Why me? Because I'm a woman and you're a man. And I need your help desperately. He's toying with me now. I can feel the change in him. There's no limit to his cruelty. I beg of you, Captain, give me my one chance. Take me away from here. I think you'd better go ashore now, Mrs. Briley. I've never found much profit in taking misunderstood wives away from husbands. I'll do anything, Phil. Anything. I don't want anything. I just want you to go ashore. Now, come on. I'll help you out. At least she didn't have a cheery invitation for the following morning. I hit the sack with a bad taste in my mouth and my stock in paradise dropping by degrees. Jane Ascot's pitch was at least different because she chose daylight in the section of beach for the setting. And it was refreshing because she wore two dark red blossoms in her blonde hair. And the rest of her did nice things to a sarong-type swimsuit because her approach was straightforward. I've been watching your ship at night, Phil. You've had a lot of visitors. Oh, I have? Do you want to talk about them? Not especially. Except that for a paradise, nobody wastes much time trusting anybody else. What's paradise to you, Phil? Money, beautiful women, things like that? Well, brief periods of that type are all right. Why? Listening to me could mean lots of money for those brief periods. Is that an offer? I understand that the men who sail ships from place to place in this part of the world are susceptible to offers. Is that right? So I've heard. Are you? I like your approach. Show me a man that wouldn't be susceptible to offers from you. <laughs> well, you're very nice to make them to. Thank you. But I'm not in the spot to accept. That's very foolish. Why? Because you're throwing away a thousand pounds sterling. And because I'm so angry with you, I might even let some of these insane people kill you. No. Now we have threats in paradise. Paradise. I'll tell you just how idyllic our paradise is. Did you know that my husband and Doris Briley are in love? You're really broken up about it, aren't you? They've been meeting under the tropic moon almost every night for months. The stupid fools. Did Briley know? Of course. You'll have to admit all of us have put on a great act. Riley and I have given them complete freedom. And the idiots don't even realize we have given it to them. Sounds like a pleasant way to live. It's rotten. But we've had a reason. They want to go away together. And we want them to go. So you and Briley can play games? Oh, not for any emotional reasons, Phil. When they disappear, as far as the world is concerned, every shilling of the Celebes Development Company's funds would disappear too. Some 10,000 pounds by now. Ah, which you and Briarly could then pocket, huh? Now, your stupid refusal to take passengers has ruined our scheme. Well, I'm sorry I'm spoiling the deal. Such a pretty one. Don't worry, Phil. I'm sure another possibility will present itself. It was after dark by the time I got away from her. I rode back to the ship and poured a couple of stiff drinks. Red was in his cabin asleep, and he mumbled impolitely at me when I tried to prod him into conversation. So I went out on the afterdeck and sat there alone, trying to clean out my system with night air, smoke, bonded disinfectant. What I had in mind slipped away when they stepped onto the deck and into the glow of our riding lights. 
I noticed the strained expressions on their faces and the small caliber revolvers in each of their right hands. Stand right there, daughters, and don't hesitate for a second if he attempts anything. All right, King. What is all this, King? Things can't go on like this, Connie. Will you listen to reason if it'll save our lives? I don't care much about saving your life. And to save your own. I mean it, Connie. We're both desperate, and your life means little to us. Doris and I are in love. We have been for months. Congratulations. Oh, I know it doesn't sound as it should, but it's true nevertheless. We didn't mean to. We couldn't help it. Tonight, Briarly learned of it. He threatened to kill us both if we didn't leave the island by tomorrow, and he's a man who lives up to his threats, Carney. Your ship is the only possible way we can leave. I'm afraid it isn't, King. Oh, well, you don't mean that. Oh, I tell you, Carney, your life is at stake. I swear I'll shoot you if you don't order this ship underway at once. Use your head, King. Or has this paradise really wrung your brain out? Where would you be if you did shoot me? No, in no worse position than I am now. I know that I'd done everything in my power to save Doris and myself. Carney, order this ship underway. I can't. You got a few hundred square miles of island. Go find yourself a hut someplace and hide in it. That wouldn't work. Your only hope, Phil. You've got to take us. But my whole voyage is at stake. That's as important to me as you are to Ascot. I warn you, Connie. Look, if you got the itch to be the big warrior for her, go shoot Briarly. Once more, Connie. All right, but you better do it right, Ascot. I'm telling you, if you don't do it with the first one, I'm going to shove that toy down your throat before you can pull the trigger again. I can't believe that you did. <laughs> Doris! Doris! Doris crumpled to the deck, raised her head loosely as King ran to kneel beside her. I saw her push her shoulders rigidly against his hands as she died. Then I learned where the shots had come from. Move out of the way, Phil. Hurry or I won't wait. I'd started toward them, but I slid back against the cabin. King Ascot was still holding the sagging body when Jane fired again. <laughs> he stiffened once, then relaxed as the second slug took him. Then he rolled over on his side quietly. Jane's canoe coasted in toward the side. What the devil's going on? Why don't you stay ashore to... What happened to them? Keep the crew in the focus, will you, Red? Go on up, tell them everything's all right. Sure, just as long as we got dead bodies all over the deck, everything's fine. I hope you didn't mind my saving your life, Phil. Yeah, that was very neatly and cold-bloodedly taken care of, wasn't it? Good heavens, it was no time for delicacy. They seemed so insistent about hurting you. Let's not kid each other. Why did you have to use my ship? Why didn't you take care of it ashore where you had more room? Why, Phil, that would have been murder. It would, huh? What do you call this? Rescue. I suppose, in a sense, it was uh, attempted piracy that I rescued you from, wasn't it? They were attempting to assume command of a vessel by use of arms or something like that. No. Oh? Rescue is a much nicer word than murder, don't you think? It always has been. Up until now. Oh, Phil. Phil, my arm, you're hurting me. A gun, gorgeous. Uh, I listen better without a gun in my face. Come on, drop it. Ow. With your quaint ideas about what is or isn't murder, it looks better in the scuppers. All right, now make sense. Phil, this wasn't all my idea. Briarly convinced Doris and King that they could force you to take them away. So that you could come out and rescue me from pirates? Phil, for a thousand pounds sterling, I did rescue you. That's what I'm supposed to say? Not for half the cut that you and Briarly now have from the Celebes Development Company. Now get off my ship. All right, Phil. But come in early in the morning, will you? We'll have breakfast and a swim and lie in the sun all day. After she left, I wondered how she'd explain to Briarly my lack of interest in the payoff. Just about the time she should have been facing him with the fact. Two evenly separated, well-placed shots echoed out from the island. We never did go ashore again. Just before dawn, a native canoe arrived to take the deceased pirates ashore. We moved out beyond the reef, radio a full report to the Dutch officials. Later that morning, Kang's lugger arrived with our sailing orders, and we headed out across the Celebes Sea. The reef, 
the mountain and the memories of Karakalong lay off our stern. And the crew jumped to with a will to rig us for our ride into the future. Report sheet! Make sail! The mainsail boomed into its job. The jibs ran up. Then the mizzen. And the Scarlet Queen winced under the pull. Settled under the help I gave her from the helm. And then charged forward, slashing the rolling swells with her bow and leaving them churned and flattened in her wake. Oscar, you want to force her anymore? Now she'll do, Red. Hey, uh, Skipper, those two shots we heard have still got me. Maybe we should have gone ashore to take a look-see. Oh, no. There might have been two more for each of us. Yeah, you can't help but wonder, though. Who do you think got him? That's pretty much of a toss-up. I think it must have been Briarly. Well, how do you figure? Very simple, Red. With all her faults... The girl was very fond of me. Uh-huh. Uh, at least she didn't kill you. Yeah, there's that, if you must have proof. Besides, she invited me to breakfast. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure she wouldn't break that date just to die. <laughs> Why, no. Even I wouldn't do that. Of course, those slugs could have been going the other way. Uh, well, or even both ways. Don't worry about it. Drink, Skipper? But it does pique a man's curiosity, Red. I wonder... Oh, well... After you, mate. After you. Log entry. The Catch Scarlet Queen. 5.30 p.m. Miles traveled from San Francisco. 20,433. Wind brisk, sky overcast. Mainsail reefed, ship secure for night. Signed, Philip Carney, Master. of the Scarlet Queen stars Elliot Lewis as Phil Carney with Ed Max as Gallagher. Music scored and conducted by Richard O'Rod. The Scarlet Queen, produced by James Burton, is written by Gil Dowd and Bob Tallman. Oh, my God.